What's up? Just battling demons and as you do fighting off hauntings in our uh, pajamas our american eagle clothing <laughs> our matching outfits and our beautiful set i feel like we are mary kate and ashley olsen in double double boil and trouble <laughs> well we do you love matching especially i do i don't mind matching but you love matching I love so it's it. nice that we get to match today yeah and this was actually unplanned it was unplanned we, were we, both, we were just like, said should we do pajamas and we both showed, and up, we both showed exactly up this it's because so, we here at Two Girls One Go share one brain cell. Best review we've ever had. <laughs> but don't do it again. This um, is Two Girls One Ghost. Two Girls One Ghost. And we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne. Hello. And I'm Sabrina. And uh, we join you here this spooky October 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 day. October November <laughs> day. One, two, three. three We're practicing a, the basics. B, C. Yeah. <laughs> From our spooky, witchy kitchen shack. Oh, this kitchen is like shack. playing mash. We live in a kitchen shack and we have 12 children. Yes. They're all in the cauldron. Yes. <laughs> they are delicious. We boil up some things over here and do some spells and are certified insane. But while we <laughs> dream of being these things, we did have a really cool experience the other day in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We had the coolest experience. Shout out to Jasmina at Dead Wicks and a Vermani podcast. Jasmina is a listener of ours and is a practicing Romani fortune teller. Yeah. So she reads tea leaves, palm, palmistry, does tarot readings. Yeah. And it's in her family. So she was taught by her grandmother <sighs> the coolest when she was in the world. six years old. Because yeah. I had asked when we were doing the tea leaf readings, so I was like, are there any like teachers or other people that you like, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe learned some things from? Yeah. And she was like, it's entirely within my family. Yeah. Like you basically inherit this ability and are taught immediately. Truly, once she said, you can speak. From like three years old, she remembers being taught how to read tea leaves and how her family would gather on Sundays and mm -hmm. have these big events and basically read each other's tea yeah. leaves, which it I think was is so, so cool. cool. And then at the end, she had us try to like read each other's and I was like, a little bit. I have no idea. I was like, I see a frog. <laughs> she was like, that is a baby. I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. But it was very, very cool. So if you're ever in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is one of my favorite places because my whole family is from there. So I'm there mm -hmm. all the time. Dead Wicks is a really, really cool store. Ethereal Emporium. Ethereal Emporium. They've got a lot of cool stuff there. We got crystals there to protect us when we were heading to the conjuring house. Mm -hmm. So they've got a lot. And Jasmina's there and she teaches. Yeah. And there's some other teachers there as well that yeah. and provide various spooky happenings. And if you missed it, it is available to rewatch on YouTube. We did a live stream and we'll link it here if you're watching on YouTube because I learned how to do that. I can link it in the video. Perfect. Link here. <laughs> link here. <laughs> link here. And then we also had a really cool experience afterwards because Deadwicks invited us to do their spectral stroll, which mm -hmm. they do every Saturday throughout the month of, I think it's from like August 31st through Halloween. Mm -hmm. And they do a ghost tour that starts at Deadwicks and you go all around Portsmouth, walking through the town, hearing the history, the hauntings. There's a lot of drama, a lot of- uh, So much drama. A lot of- women brothel stuff brothels and women just like kind of battling over the same man mm. someone on our tour made a crack that like every haunting made a crack a made a crack you know <laughs> it feels like such a british comment <laughs> made a crack <laughs> made, a, made a crack that that one guy that uh, like haunts someplace was just impregnating the whole town so there's there's just like a lot of drama there's a lot of tea and it feels like you're really getting to spill the tea spill the tea well they did at deadwicks yes and the haunted troll was so great and also we're walking up to the haunted stroll and it's dark and there's someone holding a lantern and I'm squinting my eyes and I'm like, that person looks like M. You, you had that wherewithal? Yeah, I literally told M. That's so as, funny. That's why it took me 0.2 seconds when M was like, two girls, one goes to be M because I was like, that person looks like M. But that's then I was so like, why funny. would M be in Portsmouth? M lives in Los Angeles. Right. And M was M from and that's why we drink. They were just standing there and were like saying goodbye to Jasmina. And then I was like, two girls, one ghost. And I turned them and, and they brought us hot chocolate. It was so sweet. It was so sweet. So they had their show. And that's why we drink had a live show at the music hall in mm -hmm. Portsmouth the night prior. On tour. Yeah. I guess M went into Deadwicks earlier the day that day. And they were like, oh, 
are you the podcast that's coming on the ghost tour later? And Emma's was like, no, but what podcast is coming on the tour <laughs> later? And when they found out it was us, Emma's was like, well, I was already going to go on this, but now I'm definitely going yeah. and surprising Corinne and Sabrina. Oh, it was so great. It was so it, fun. It like, made the night. Too. It was such a delight. Yeah. Uh, how great. I just wish everyone lived here. <laughs> <laughs> it did kind of feel like that for a moment. It did. Like yeah. running into someone in town. Yeah. A town that we don't even live in. No, right. And M lives 3,000 miles away. Right. But it was it was awesome. A delightful fright. So if you guys have any suggestions of like cool ghost walking tours or really interesting people or places to go get like <laughs> you know any freaks, interesting people. You, <laughs> yeah. But I mean like comment it on our Instagram or on the YouTube video yeah. because I feel like people are always when we're doing this sort of stuff people are like oh my gosh I'm in Seattle do you know anyone out here yeah so I feel like that this is a good video to have a little bit of like a running list going a running list mm -hmm. I love it so official what did you think of your tea leaf reading I mean I felt like it was pretty accurate well it was interesting because Jasmina had there were a few things that like didn't feel like it would have meant anything to me if it happened if the reading happened like one week prior so it was very accurate it seemed accurate like I, yeah. I could assign certain things yeah I felt like mine but it was like the last thing that Jasmina told us about the jellyfish mm -hmm. that brought everything together and I was like oh my gosh this makes so much sense but it yeah. was like individually it almost was like I was trying to be like hmm how does this relate and then it was all brought together by the final thing. I also black out every time I get a reading. Well, good thing we live streamed it so, you so can I can go back it. and rewatch. I don't know. Yeah. And I also I feel myself, I don't know if it's this like element of when you're doing a paranormal or spiritual esque reading, I shut down. I almost because it's it's like it's yeah. almost like therapy where it's emotional or, right. or it can be and personal. And, well, and you're also if people of didn't know, I have been very secretive about my life. So I feel like I almost like repress into myself. Yeah. And I feel my face go like I'm I'm not readable for people. Well, it's, it's one of those things where it's hard because you're both trying to listen to what someone's saying, but then also trying to like assign meaning from what they're saying. Right. Apply it. But then there's a the skeptical part where you're like, is it? Well, am I just grasping at straws? Like, what does yeah. this mean? But I feel like there's so many readings I've had in the past that were just so completely wrong, just from like popping into random shops here and there, right. that I do feel like there's a difference with like what we had with Jasmina with the TV reading and like some other ones where I go and there's a tarot deck yeah. and someone pulls out the book and then they're reading from the book what the cards mean. And I'm like, you're like, you're going to marry a man with green eyes and he's really tall with dark hair. And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm not. And I didn't. <laughs> I actually had a moment the other night where we were pulling tarot cards and it clicked for me for the first time. Oh, you understood? And and it wasn't. It's your intuition. It's that halo Well, I think, from when we had the aura reading. I think because we had done the tarot episode where I learned about how it is basically a deck of cards and there's mm -hmm. the four suits, like the cups, the wands. See, I don't even know all of them. And then each card, like one through 10, has a different assignment. Mm -hmm. I think the like mathematical equation of it finally clicked in my mind. Wow. But I don't, the understandings has not clicked. But I mean, that's to come. It's a beginning. It's a beginning. It's a start. It's a baby, baby witch. witch. Well, we're not oh. talking about witches in this episode. We have something else to talk about. I know, I'm scared. This is a two-parter. I wrote the entire two parts with my thumb in one hand while my child napped on me. <laughs> it took me about 50 hours. Okay. <laughs> Also, can we just talk about how we've learned nothing over the years? Because, you know, every fall Halloween season, we love to get into the spooky. And we've gotten ourselves into trouble in the past by doing such a thing. We always talk about the spooky, but come October, we're like, ooh, let's talk about demons and possession. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about them and then they hear us talking about them and they're like, what are these and girls like, doing? Let's up? go check them out. Yeah. And then they do something and then we get scared and then we quit. And then for some reason, yeah. 330 days later, we're like, we should do this let's again. Do it again. We forget it all. Or we miss it. We like to be scared. Yeah. Also, there is a very likely possibility, me being positive over here, hello, that it's not demons or dark spirits coming to check us out although check me out um <laughs> <laughs> not me though check her out <laughs> go home sabrina we haven't had coffee <laughs> no i have not actually i left mine in the car 
But it's a, a protective spirit or a guardian of ours being like, you stupid, silly girls. You it's never Sven. learn. It's Sven. It's Sven being like, come on. Sven is in surgery at the moment. Something happened to him during my maternity leave. We have Sven's uh, little brother. Yeah. <laughs> this is his cousin, down. Gus. He's from Honey, We Shrunk the Kids, and he has not been unshrunken. No. Sven was birthed, but Gus came out of a cocoon. Oh, I like that his name is Gus. Yeah. Did you just come up with that? Yeah, I did. Oh, that's cute. I said it 30 seconds ago. It just clear like- that you're not listening to me. <laughs> The fight begins. Or my brain is slow. <laughs> Let's spar. Let's get out our swords. Another suit of the tarot deck. Ha ha! Actually, Loki would be really fun. That would be fun. I I took stage combat. I did in not. School. So watch out. The swords are heavy. They're. I'm not going to be good at wielding them. Or maybe I will be. I will be. And nevertheless, here we are talking about possessions. Nothing. Oh, okay. Possessions. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about basically nothing, and now we're talking about possessions. Yes. Yeah. Because there was a family in West Pittston, Pennsylvania, who okay. was terrorized by a demon. So badly, the demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren were called to go investigate. And this is the true case and possession of the Smurl family. Smurl. Smurls. S-M-U-R-L. So for this episode, I did read a book <laughs> surprise surprise a finished book and the book was called the haunted one family's nightmare it was the third book authored by ed and lorraine warren co-written by robert coran and jack and janet smurl the hauntees also contributed to writing the book it is just oh. packed with details of their haunting what i would give to be a fly on the wall within one of these writing sessions no like the actual experience oh god there were so many people who were witness to this. So <sighs> you didn't need to be a fly on the wall. They were inviting people in left and right to try to help them. West Pittston, Pennsylvania. The town has a deep history of coal mines, which was obviously notoriously a terrible job. A lot of children involved, a lot of deaths, super dangerous, awful conditions. And as the Industrial Revolution came to an end, the coal mines that had originally brought a bunch of people to the town, they eventually closed. And so basically, there's a bunch of abandoned coal mines and just like tunnels running all underneath this town. Over the next several decades, the mines filled with water and homes began to sink. So this town like started to basically get destroyed from these. Like swallowed up by the coal mines. Exactly. So some caved in and the townspeople started to talk about demons and the idea that demons were coming through the coal mines. What year was this? This was in the early to mid 1900s. Okay. I was trying to or think early of, 1900s. Okay, because I was point. like trying to imagine if it's like satanic panic time, but I guess that fear kind of could always be. Well, uh, I mean, eventually, I think yeah. it just kind of like permeated like through many decades. Yeah. It just existed. I just love the turn towards demons. Right, as it's cause. like oh, there's water in these tunnels, and my house just sank. Demon. Demon. <laughs> But that was the idea of these townspeople. They were like, there's something, there's so many houses that are being damaged and being swallowed up that are these tunnels that remain vacant and dug so deep, potentially to the underworld, an access point for demonic entities to crawl up to West Pittston, Pennsylvania. And many thought, yes. It was believed that the land itself was cursed, having been used for satanic purposes. So there was some thought about that. And the theory evolved not because of the satanic panic, but because of a supposed discovery of pig bones that was found underneath one of the damaged houses. So these pig Hmm. bones were placed in this hexagram shape, which made people start to think, oh my gosh, was there witchcraft here? And so just so many homes were cracking and sinking. And so there was kind of this idea festering amongst the townspeople. Hmm. There was one particular home that seems to be the epicenter of paranormal activity. 328 and 330 Chase Street, a duplex, two units in this one building. Perfect. A double, double, double trouble. D- <laughs> double the trouble. Double, double <laughs> trouble. A duplex built in 1896. It was owned eventually by the Smurl family, which is why we have this story today. When the Smurl family lived there, was it just a single family home or was it still a duplex? No, it was a duplex already. Oh. Yeah. And it had been two, well, I'll, I'll get there, but two, okay. it was separate. The Smurl family ended up taking up both sides that's of the right. duplex. Okay. That's what I was asking. Yeah. yeah so yeah, there yeah. wasn't anyone not related okay, to so the Smurls when they were there. Okay. On the other side. 
But long before the Smurls moved in, rumors circulated around this house. So it was already kind of like a, ooh, this is kind of a weird, spooky house. Mm. It was said that the police had been called in numerous times to investigate odd occurrences here. Ooh. Neighbors said terrible things happened there. They would catch glimpses of horrifying acts through the windows. People were thinking that they were witnessing satanic things happening inside. But then again, with the satanic panic and everything, it's like, sure. Was, but, were these rumors or was yeah. this? And then was this just like the house that yeah, the every neighborhood has where yes. people have these legends and as you like are dared to go ring the doorbell, you exactly. see something and yeah. Right. Yeah. So we don't know and the Smurls no. obviously didn't know. But the neighbor said that when the house would be unoccupied, the lights would turn on as if someone was inside. There appeared to always be some permanent residents there. Cool, cool, cool. When approaching the duplex... The house had this really eerie vibe. So I guess it kind of stood alone amongst various other homes in terms of its energy. So the rest Mm. of the neighborhood felt really good. There wasn't that much paranormal activity, I guess, outside of this. And the duplex, there are many other duplexes, some single family homes. Like it was a normal neighborhood. But for some reason, this one duplex that like didn't look scary felt off when you passed it. I'm imagining, and this is kind of like the reverse of it, but in Barbarian, how at night, the town looked totally normal. And then during the day, you realize how dilapidated all the other houses are in the street. I'm almost imagining oh, yeah. like the way the dilapidated houses are is this house. And I know it doesn't yeah. look that way, but, but the it feels feel, that way. Yeah, yeah. It definitely does. Okay. So now enter the Smurl family. Jack Smurl, we'll go back in, in time a little bit to learn about him. So he had joined the Navy after high school. He worked as a neuropsychiatric technician. So He was actually involved in some electroshock therapy treatments through the Navy. And Janet Smurl, she was not a part of the Navy. She was quite the intellectual and considered a few different careers. But her main goal at the time was to be a mother. That's really what she wanted to do. She wanted to have a family. So before she got to that point, before she met Jack, she ended up working in a packaging department for a company, which happened to be the same company Jack worked for. They didn't meet for a little bit, but then eventually at a Christmas party, of course, they meet. And also, if you're thinking, which I was thinking when I was reading the book, I got like a little snotty being like, how come they're talking about all of Jack's accolades? And then as soon as they get to Janet, they're like, she was super smart, but all she aspired to do was just birth children, which is fine. Like that, I mean, some people that is. Yeah. I kind of want to too. But, <laughs> but, and then do the your hobby time, of talking ghost stories. Yes. At the same time, it was uh, one of those things where I was just like, what the heck? And then as soon as I had that thought, the next sentence, they were saying (laughs) Jack was 27 years old. He was unmarried. He's basically too old to be single in this area. Like, what a loser. (laughs) I hope that they literally said, what a loser. (laughs) That's basically, it made me think of the, um, and I quote, (laughs) the Jane Austen audio. Do you remember that from the movie? It was like, I'm 27 years old, unmarried. I have no money and no prospects. I'm already a burden to my family. (laughs) But that was Jack Smurl. He had no okay. money, no prospects, a burden to his family, 27 years old, loser. 27, you guys. <laughs> so if I can say anything. Take your time. Take your time. Relax. Don't rush and do it. No. <laughs> you can be 90 years old and get married. Get married. Yeah. So the two meet. They fall in love, Jack and Janet. Mm. And they share many interests. They have the same vision for having a family. And they're both Catholic. And they both have names that start with J. Yes, it's the J and J. By December 28th, 1968, they marry and they move in with Jack's parents. But unfortunately, in 1972, Hurricane Agnes flooded Jack's parents' house. It was 12 feet of water. And I don't know if the renovation happened before or after this flooding. I think it was after. But basically, I think they like tried to rescue the house and they were forced to move like the city was like nope this is i mean 12 feet of water salvageable. is a lot of damage Jeez. yeah so enter 328 and 330 chase street a duplex in a nearby town that seemed perfect for this multi-generational family mm. it was newer compared to several of the other duplexes across the street the neighborhood was filled with working class people it was a bunch of single family homes that were starting to pop up Seems so it was like right yeah they were like oh this Promising. we're gonna get a great return on investment here, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is, this is on the up and up, this neighborhood. We're guaranteed to increase in value. So let's, let's move into this place. This seems perfect. So the Smurls move in. One of the units had been owned by a woman who rented it out to tenants over years. So there are many different people cycling through that unit. 
The other one, there was an older man who had owned it, but he had left it unoccupied for several years. So it was basically vacant. The Summerals move in and life was perfect. They did the whole family thing. They did, you know, church and going to kids' games and going all Going to these... Texas Roadhouse afterwards. Yes, you know, dinners. The Sunday they sing happy brunch. birthday on the on the little like lasso rodeo I was like, saddle. What are you? I was like, it's the saddle. Right in the bowl. Texas Roadhouse. They put you on the saddle. <laughs> happy birthday to you. <laughs> and then you cry because you're embarrassed. But they did all of that, <laughs> and everything seemed great. They were super involved with their community. They participated in a lot of civic events. They were mm-hmm. on a bunch of different boards. They were very involved. The kids that they had and were having while in this place, it, I mean, everything just seemed really golden, and they were so How happy. How many kids did they have? They had four. Okay. At the time that they moved in, they did not yet have all four. Okay. So they were so happy that they missed some early signs of hauntings. As many people do. Yes. It's easy to explain things away, yes. especially when you want to. Yes. When you don't want to When you just be true. invested your money in yes. a home. Yep. For 18 months, odd things happened here and there, and the Smurls continued to excuse it away. That's a lot of time for things to start to ramp up. For example, Mary Smurl, Jack's mom, she purchased a new red rug, and it came with a large grease stain, and she and her husband, John, Jack's father. So Mary and John are the older Smurls, the in-laws slash parents slash grandparents. They were able to scrub out the stain. And then the next day they come down and the stain is there again. And this sort of continued until eventually they got a new rug. And they were like, that's so bizarre. Like when you get a stain out, it shouldn't, yeah. and it dries and everything and it's not there, it shouldn't reappear, whatever. But they get a new rug and the new rug is fine. So it's like, okay. well, that's not a haunting. That was just a weird rug. Rug. Yeah. And weird stain. Yeah. In the other duplex, Jack Smurl, he's watching TV one evening, an old Western film, and suddenly, completely unprompted, the television bursts into flames. Okay. And it wasn't like it just sparked and sputtered and there was a light fire. It was so intense that it actually completely melted before Jack was able to get the fire extinguisher and put it out. It was torched. Which I guess you could say was an electrical issue, or you could say like maybe too many things were running at once, or, you know... I understand why yeah. you wouldn't immediately jump to paranormal with that. And there were, I mean, it was an older place. It was built yeah. in the late 1800s and there was a lot of electrical issues and they would blame a lot of things on the electric. Yeah. So a few other examples of things they explained away. Jack and Janet's new electric stove also caught fire. Wiring in the brand new car that they purchased fizzled out and other small unexplained fires and electrical problems just throughout the house. The car thing is wild because yeah. that's so- It's brand new. It's and now, it's separate from the house. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. John Smurl, who was an experienced welder, he soldered 30-some joints while renovating and updating the duplex. Soldered? Soldered. What does that mean? When you, like, burn the metal. Oh, okay. Melt it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And when the water was turned on, all of the joints leaked, even though he had just fixed them all. So he did it a second time. And this was kind of like the theme of the house. He'd have to, like fix everything multiple times and just keep fixing it. And the it was, house was like gaslighting him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was like basically saying whatever was a small job for a handyman would become a huge renovation for the Smurls because nothing would go right. Interesting. One of the drain pipes had been replaced five times before it was eventually usable. Jack and Janet also remodeled their bathroom. They put in a new sink, a new tub. They're so excited. The very next morning after installing it, they walk in and the porcelain sink and tub had scratch marks and chips all <gasps> over it, like that beyond gives repair. That me chills, especially because I know where this is going. Yeah. And I think it demon, looked like a beast was uh, like let loose, like clawing its way through. But again, they're like, that's weird. I don't know what could have done that. Woodwork and the ceiling that had just been painted. Jack woke up the next morning, claw marks across the whole thing. Ruined. Everything new they do, clawed away. How do they explain that away? How I do th- you explain I claws? think this was the point where they're starting to be like, Oh, this is not just, this might be something more. So weird wiring, unexplained things. Maybe they could explain away an old house and have some terrible luck and maybe that's what's going on. But to have all of their new renovations destroyed overnight, they couldn't quite explain that. The Smurl family had to accept what was going on. And so do you. (laughs) Speaking of things that we need to accept, we need to accept that American Eagle has the cutest, most comfortable Halloween spooky clothing for both men and women. Yes. 
It's spooky season all year round. And now that we have these clothes, we're going to be wearing them all year round. Yeah, we are. Celebrate Halloween with us all year round. And what's even more exciting is that American Eagle has partnered up with us and wants to dress you in their Halloween collection as well. We're doing a giveaway on our Instagram to win a $500 gift card to shop all of their Halloween sweats and shirts. So head to our Instagram at two girls, one ghost to enter now through October 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Happy, Happy hauntings. hauntings. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack and Janet, they have an eldest daughter. Her name is Dawn. And Dawn would regularly run into their room screaming in the middle of the night because she had seen people floating in her room. Floating. Yes, floating. Jack would hurry into his daughter's room each time because obviously he was thinking someone was breaking in. Yeah. And every single time he would look around and no one would be there. He'd look around the house and there was no evidence that anyone had been in the house. The toilets would flush in the middle of the night. Radios would turn on at full volume, even though they weren't plugged in. That's so this terrifying. could not be an electrical issue. That means the ghosts are the electricity. Yes. Footsteps would be heard throughout the house. Drawers would open and close. Lights would flicker. Classic haunting, am I right? Mm. Oh, maybe the scratch <laughs> a little marks bit more a little extreme. More intense. <laughs> Some of these other things, classic. Sure. Yes. Destroying any renovations with beastly claws. claws concerning very very clued into it being a demon if you were us if you were the smurls they were really hopeful that it was just no big deal yeah <laughs> which all i feel like all movies and traditional hauntings we know about and talk about do begin this way yes they do yes so it's now 1977 a year after they first moved in and sharon and karen are born twin girls Sharon and Karen. Sharon and Karen. Karen was spelled C-A-R-I-N. Oh. Isn't that interesting? Different spelling. So Sharon and Karen, they're born, and this is making the Smurl family a family of four. So they have daughters, Dawn, Heather, Shannon, and Karen. Sharon and Karen? Sharon. What did I say? Shannon. You know, I wrote Shannon in here, <laughs> and I also wrote Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Which Sharon could be Shannon, and Shannon could be Sharon. So we might find out along the way. All we know the book. <laughs> is that Sharon, Shannon, Karen for sure wore matching outfits all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there were four girls. <laughs> yeah. That's basically where we're at. Yeah. So not long after the arrival of the twins, Janet and Jack woke to the sound of their lawn chairs creaking on their front porch. It sounded like someone was like, ee, 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 creaking back. So they're like, oh, my God, someone's on our porch. So they make their way okay. down only to find that the chairs are empty, but they are actively rocking, rocking <laughs> back and forth. This would be the perfect time for us to be in rocking chairs. I know. Ugh. We should bring down my nursing chair. Rocking baby. So they had four kids in this house. Some of them, I think their first two daughters they had prior to moving Okay. In. But physically in the house, there were four girls. Okay. So the house began to be a bit more reactive now. And the Smurls did not have much control over what went on. But again, it all seemed a little bit somewhat harmless aside from some items being destroyed. Yep. For example, one day the thermostat read 70 degrees, but the house was absolutely freezing inside. And so they left it off. It's just like a weird quirk of the house or a weird <laughs> haunting quirk. Quirky little ghosts. You quirky, silly ghosts <laughs> with quirky, your ghost dirty so long cold. nails. <laughs> but things started to get a bit more personal. One night Jack was sleeping and he felt Janet reach out and kind of give him a little, you know, suggestive little tickle. An invitation. So he turns around expecting his wife to be Yo, there. Wee wah wee wee. Yes. And she is dead asleep. So he's like, that's weird. Another night, Jack's parents had thought that they heard Jack and Janet yelling and swearing at each other, just like a vicious fight breaking out between them. But they hadn't been fighting. In fact, they literally weren't even home that night. So it's not like they were just Ooh. lying and being like, no, we, that wasn't us fighting. Like, we're perfect. They literally were not home. On top That's of all scary of this. Because it feels like the spirits are now manipulating the both, though they are of the same family. Yeah. Like knowing how to manipulate each yep. part of the house. Yeah. And also just to clarify in the duplex, Jack and Janet and their four daughters were on one side. Mary and John Smurl, Jack's father and mother, were on the other side. So it's like they shared a wall mm -hmm. up and down the house. Yeah. On top of all of this, the house also started to smell like, quote, Jack's smelly feet, which is what the kids would joke. All the daughters would joke about. They would say like, <gasps> oh, hi, it smells like daddy's stinky feet. Is this holes? 
<laughs> Stanley Young ass. <laughs> well, the curse. It's also one of those things where I think like when you're a little kid, like that's a that's an easy way to explain or maybe as parents, it's an easy way to encourage kids to not be scared because right. the whole house, no matter how much they would clean it, reeked. It just had this like the most foul odor. Sulfuric. You could say some rotten eggs. Dun, dun, dun. And they could also never locate where the smell was coming from. But the smell wasn't always there either. So it wasn't there when they moved in Mm -hmm. or when they purchased the house. The smell, as they later recalled, only appeared for the first time when Jack decided to kneel before his bed one night and pray the rosary. So a religious act triggered this scent. And also, did he pray the rosary because of things that were happening? Was that like... No, I think he was just, he was pretty Catholic, very involved in the but church. But he had never done stuff. that until that one time? Well, I'm not sure how much time had passed okay, between okay. them moving in, but like it wasn't, it wasn't a permanent smell okay. until they had already moved in. So maybe okay. it was like two weeks that went by okay, for all okay. we know. I'm not sure, but it wasn't there when they moved in. It started right after he prayed. An act of defiance. Yep. The Smurl family would soon go from amused to scared. Yep. Wondering if the house was indeed falling apart because everything was breaking. Yeah. Janet reached out to the Department of Mines because she was like, maybe our house is one of those ones that is sinking into a cave. And that could explain all the weird like cracking, chipping porcelain and you know, okay. the electrical issues, like something's happening, like weird noises. Creeps, I get it. Like the ground is moving beneath us. So people come out and they investigate and there is literally no evidence that their house is cracking or crumbling or one of the ones affected by the mine. I so, appreciate the going through the rational, like checking off the boxes to make right. sure it's not X, Y, and the Z. The non-paranormal yeah. options. That's actually, thank you for for correcting me there because paranormal is rational. It's often the answer. Yes. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> During the day, Janet, she would spend a lot of time at home cooking and cleaning because at this point she had become a stay-at-home parent and she enjoyed having the television on while she did this. So a lot of the times the girls were out of the house. She just had like the noise going on in the background mm-hmm. as she went around and kind of like did whatever she wanted to do. Sometimes she would sit, relax, enjoy. But on this particular day, she was watching a game show in the background as she made her way down to the basement, which is where the laundry was. Why? Why is it always in the basement? Because that's where they put it back in the 60s. <sighs> So Janet, she makes her way downstairs. She enters the basement and she is doing the laundry. And she's still able to hear the sounds of the TV above her. It was loud enough. And she can hear the host. She can hear kind of like the amused noises of the audience members. And so she's not thinking anything of it. She's not spooked. Everything is normal. But then suddenly there was a noise that she heard that did not feel as distant as the television. She heard her name audibly and clear. Janet. Janet. She feels like it's coming from the basement. So she turns around and it's an empty basement. She's looking around. There's just like boxes of decoration. Just like it, it's a storage. Right. It's a basement. But it's a basement. <laughs> there's also a window and it's the middle of the day. So she there's some light coming in so she can see around. It's not completely dark okay. down there. And so she's looking around. Nothing's out of the ordinary. Nothing is right. misplaced it's or whatever. Fine. Yeah. It's fine. Seemingly. Yes. And then she hears it again. Janet. And a third time now, Janet, that was right behind her. And so she spun around, but no one was there. And a fourth time, Janet. Well, that time it was said <laughs> softly, actually. Oh, Janet. It sounded like a female's voice. Ooh. And then a fifth time, Janet. So now Janet's heard her name five times as she's whipping around looking for who's saying it. And she's very clearly understanding that she's not alone in the basement. That's so she says. What do you want? And there's no response. Some time passes, and then she hears her name again. Janet. What do you want? And again, Janet. No answer. Janet is now shaking in fear. She steps backwards towards the store. She's walking backwards up the stairs so that she has eyes on the basement. And halfway up the stairs, she hears Janet. And she turns and she bolts up the rest of the stairs. She slams the door closed. She runs to her bedroom. She grabs her rosary. And then she heads to the kitchen and with her rosary in hand, she gets on her knees and starts praying in the light of the kitchen where she feels most safe. After she's done praying, she then spends the rest of the afternoon wandering around the house, praying until her kids come home. She That's checked so every, scary. So scary. She Ugh. checked every room. She checked every closet under the bed. There were no signs of a break-in, no intruder. 
She had no idea what was going on, but obviously suspected a haunting. Yes. Previously, they tried to explain things away. This, Janet could not think of a single excuse. No. The night after hearing her name being called, Janet was like, I need to talk to Jack. I need to talk to my husband. I think I should probably confide in him because that scared the absolute shit out of me, even though this is embarrassing and I feel uncomfortable talking about this. So she tells him that she's scared. She didn't feel alone in the basement. Something was there. It was a presence and it knew her name. Some time goes by now and there's not much happening in the house. There's some little odd things that they keep chalking up to it just being an old house. But clearly, there is something more because it starts to escalate again. The paranormal activity is now daily. While Jack and Janet had experienced most of it, their children are now experiencing it. So the eldest, Dawn, had seen some things, but now all four daughters are experiencing paranormal activity. They're picking up on the anxieties of their parents. The happy home is now becoming an extremely, extremely anxious one. At breakfast, the oldest daughter, Dawn, suggested that Janet needs to get out of the house. She was like, Mom, you're clearly very stressed. Why don't you just leave the house today and just not be here alone? So great suggestion, Dawn. Way to look out for your mom. Seriously. Dawn did not know what happened to her mom in the basement. She just knew that her mom was being on edge. So she was like, Kids are very in tune. So Janet listened to Dawn and she headed out once all the kids went to school. So she went to the mall, she did some shopping. And when she returned, she put all of the items that she'd purchased onto the table and sorted through them, was laundering them. And then she grabbed the iron to use on a few of the blouses to kind of press them. And she had this hot iron in her hand when a sudden chill went through the air. And Janet looked up calmly and she stood there completely still and questioned if she was hallucinating because there was a figure in front of her. In front of her. It was black. It was hooded. It was human shaped. It was faceless. And it was wearing a cape. Its body was fluid. It was made of black smoke almost. And it had a really strange odor with it that filled the air. It seems like it. It was just under six feet because she could see kind of where the figure stood in comparison to the refrigerator. And the entity moved past her out of the kitchen and into the living room. Janet just stood there for a few moments, completely frozen, obviously, heart racing. Like you just saw some paranormal activity. You just saw an entity and she just couldn't move. She was totally paralyzed with fear, the hot iron still in her hand. Yeah. When she finally gathers herself, this brave, brave woman then walks through the house to see if she can find this intruder, well, hoping it's a human at this point. It's not. And she doesn't find anything. It's interesting because it almost felt like so deliberate to show up there and then walk into the living room that I thought like I would expect something to have happened right. in the living room. Right. Because it like, yeah, showed itself and then was trying to lead her to follow it. So Janet is sufficiently spooked. She doesn't see anyone. And she, instead of staying in this place and praying and waiting for her kids to come home this time, she's like, I'm going to run to the other side of the duplex to my in-laws. <laughs> Peace out. Peace out. Great idea. So she sprints over to the other side. She busts open the door. She like runs upstairs and her mother-in-law, Mary, is there and Mary's sitting there. And Janet's getting ready to be like, oh, my God, like, you're going to think I'm crazy, but this is what happened to me. But Mary, who's normally very warm and greets her, hi, hello, she's just sitting in the chair (gasps) and she seems (gasps) like white as a ghost. And she goes, I have something to tell you, Janet. And Janet's like, girl, I have something to tell you. Girl. Girl, I have something to tell you. And Mary then describes that she saw a black figure (sighs) come through from the stairway into her living room and then it just disappeared. And the description Mary gave was the exact same description that Janet had just experienced basically at the same moment. So this entity was moving through the duplex at the same time, passing by both Janet and Mary. I am grateful that they both experienced it because I feel like often it's one person who is targeted and it sounded like it was going to be Janet, but Mm -hmm. she's not alone. She's not alone. Yeah. So this was the first time they ever saw something materialize and then – It just never happened again for quite some time. And so they were thinking, like, maybe this presence just really wanted to be acknowledged. It wanted to be a part Mm. of the house. It wanted us to know that it lived here first, and now everything is golden. We can go back to being this happy little family. Or it's a tactic where terrify you, then let you relax for a second, and then bam. Let your guard down. And that's exactly what happened. 
So for a few weeks, activity ceased and they began to relax a little bit. I'd be such a good demon. <laughs> You I know think that's, everything. That's you what I'm learning. Have learned the psyche of a demon. Yeah, I'd be a good one. Jack had previously developed a bit of a temper moving into the house, mm -hmm. and Janet had been flooded with anxiety. These are things that are kind of classic indications of paranormal activity and a haunting. It was just very unlike them to be like that. And so, with these few weeks where nothing happened, they could feel themselves sort of ease up a little bit more and more, start to kind of become a little bit more of themselves again. And they waited and they waited and still nothing happened. And they were finally like, oh my gosh, I think, I think it's over. Janet and Jack remember actually turning to each other and being like, is it over at these hauntings? And while they were hesitant, they both agreed, yes, the home was quiet. They were in the clear. Everything was going to be okay. Their kids were going to be okay. Life was good. Now it's spring. So many weeks have passed. Their 13-year-old Kim is getting ready for confirmation at their local church. And her sister, Shannon, not Sharon, <laughs> Shannon is in the kitchen and mom Janet is there working on Kim's dress. Suddenly, a massive tearing sound just rips through the kitchen and the large ceiling light above them comes <gasps> crashing down. Oh. The, all three of them try to leap out of the way, but Shannon gets hit from the ceiling light. And so it was clear in this moment that again, something related to their faith, something related to Catholicism was a really big trigger for violent activity or something aggressive to kind of reappear. So this right. was the first moment that this thing showed itself again after weeks of dormancy. So clearly their faith triggered this entity. Yes. And it tried to hurt Janet's child in front of her eyes. Well, it tried to hurt all of them. It did, yes. And it did true. actually it hurt did Janet. It did hurt her child. Yeah. So Janet then spent months after this. She was like, that's it. She's researching. She's reaching out to parapsychologists and investigators begging for help. She was desperate for anyone to believe in her and have some real suggestions on how to get rid of this yeah. thing. A few weekends after the falling light incident, the family heads out for a camping trip. And this was something they did often. They liked to camp. They'd go out to, like I think, the Poconos or something like that. Yeah. So with the house empty, you would assume that the spirits may lay dormant, right? There's no one there to provoke. There's no one to feed on. But there were people. The neighbors. I was going to say. <laughs> One couple walking by heard what sounded like large wings, like a giant bird Ew. flapping and flapping, followed by what they described as someone screaming in pain that was so agonizing it sounded like someone was getting axe murdered. It's interesting because it's like, does that, I mean, maybe we'll learn a history or, or something because I don't know, but does that imply a Rosemary's Baby type of satanic ritual that existed or happened on the property, or is it a tactic to scare and startle passerbys? Maybe both. Okay. Maybe both. So people would continue to hear things from Janet and Jack Smurl's home. Many heard what sounded like kids playing, and even the grandparents at times thought that they were hearing their grandchildren playing when the Smurls were not home. Mm -hmm. They would hear people running around, and the entity was clearly now mimicking the family. Yep. So the family, the Smurls, they return from their trip and they hear stories from neighbors that are like, hey, were you in town? Like, this is so weird. I was hearing this weird thing. And they're like, holy shit, this is terrifying. And now we just have to live in this home and wait for the next thing to happen. Right. But life did kind of move on again, oddly. It was like another patch of it being a little bit quiet. So the kids had school. They had after school activities. And again, things were quieter. And so Janet decides to go take her kids shopping for some new school clothes. So while they're out, Jack drifted off to sleep. He's alone in the house. Oh, no. He's suddenly aware of the feeling of floating. Oh, like he's floating. Yes. So he's in this dreamlike state and he's like, I totally feel suspended. I feel like I'm floating. And then he realized he could hear everything around him. He could hear the street noise. He could hear the hum of the electricity in their house. He could smell his room. He could feel the clothes on his skin. So he then thinks, am I awake? And he opens his eyes. Ah, yes, he is awake. But he's not in his bed. Jack is levitating two feet above his bed, completely paralyzed, unable to move, except for to move his eyes and look around the room. And it's his actual body. It's his body. He's trying to fight it. He wiggles. He attempts to sit up. And whatever is keeping him there suddenly reacts to his attempts to break free. And it 
throws him aggressively down onto the bed. Jack jumps up really quickly and demands the demon to show himself in a very Zach Bagans moment. Show yourself, demon. All right. But nothing. And this would not be the last time that they were attacked, especially in the Smurl primary bedroom. My body is like not like I started drooling. Like I, like, <laughs> I had to wipe my mouth. It just like, gets I'm not. worse and worse and worse and worse. Like as I was reading this book, I was like, how can there be another chapter? How can there be another chapter? How can there be another chapter? It just keeps getting worse and worse. Well, that's the thing I feel like with so many hauntings and, and possession cases or demonic attacks, it starts small. Mm hmm. And there's so many of them that we've probably covered on the podcast that we share the really big moments, but there's yeah. a lot that leads up there's to it. There's a lot. Yeah. A lot of small little events. Yeah. And I'm sure this book that I read didn't even have most of it. Right. And Jeez. it still was jam-packed. So nothing shows itself. They would continue to be attacked, though. And one evening, the attack came back to the bedroom. Jack and Janet had just engaged in sex, and they were cuddling after, and Jack was snuggled <laughs> they canoodled janet is snuggling into jack's arms and suddenly and viciously her right leg is grabbed and someone is trying to tug her off of the bed and out of jack's arms and this is terrifying and they're both witnessing it and jack is holding on tight to janet feeling the immense force that's trying to rip her from the bed and janet is basically like almost screaming she's yeah. just trying to like wiggle and hold on to jack as hard as she can suddenly something overtakes Jack. He becomes paralyzed so he can no longer hold her. So he's like <gasps> being held down so that Janet can get ripped off of the bed. And so she's now grasping all the sheets in the bed, grasping at Jack's body. Is she she's, naked? I don't, didn't say, but probably. And she is fighting for her life. Oh my, she that's is horrifying. yanked to the edge of the bed, but then that is where it ended up stopping. Some reason unknown to them, the entity just gives up. It releases her. It releases Jack. And then it smacks and bangs the walls. Boom, 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 boom. All around their house. The smell of sulfur fills the room and it's nauseating. It's terrifying. <sighs> On numerous occasions, they witness this white mist come in and cover their room and then gather in the shape of a person moving towards the closet and disappearing. And then mm. on one particular night, Jack is again in his room. And he wakes up to find his necklace of St. Jude has been lifted over his head when he slept and taken off of him. So the entity oh, is proving that it is more powerful than Jack's faith or that is what the message that it's trying to convey is. That's terrifying. Yes. To also wake up to that. I know. And to like taunt his religion, to show yeah. its strength. It's really terrifying to be like anything I had that I thought would protect me. This thing can so clearly and easily take it from me. This is nothing. So now they're learning this thing could hurt them. It could taunt them. It could make them the neighborhood pariah. But there's one thing that they did not want it to do. And that is fuck with Simon. Who the hell is Simon? Yeah, what? Simon is their dog. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> with a human name. I love it. The demon did try to target Simon. Janet was in the kitchen with Simon by her feet when the German shepherd is suddenly lifted into the air and then smashed down on the no, ground. Simon. And the dog is in pain. And it was such oh, a sweet dog, like, too. They were yelped. like, he had such a good disposition. And yes, he was howling in pain. He was Aww. so scared. And Janet didn't know what to do. So she just threw herself over him and like hovered over him, trying to protect him from whatever unseen force was like trying to attack him. And the demon would continue to hurt Simon. And Janet would helplessly just time and time again throw herself over the dog each time, trying to sh shield him from this entity. Aww. And so now she's growing angry that it's hurting this innocent animal. And the Smurl kids, they're now becoming a target as well. And the girls are witnessing the strength of the demon. It's throwing pots and pans around. It had a ceiling light crash onto Shannon. It will punch their pillows. It scratches at the walls as they try to sleep. So, so many things are happening that Janet is like, I'm at my wit's end and I'm about to fucking lose it. Yeah. And so she ran into one of her kids' rooms and she demanded that the demon leave her kids alone. But unfortunately, Janet's demands on behalf of her children and Simon were went unheard. Yeah. If anything, it sounds like this demon's like, you tell me no, I'm going to do know. it more. Yeah. Now I know yeah. how to push your button even more. Yeah. One evening, all of the girls, they're tucked into bed. It's time to go to bed, put to bed. And Shannon is happy to be on the top bunk, protected away from everything as her younger sister sleeps below her. 
Is she safer though? I feel like poor Shannon. (laughs) Poor Shannon. So sometime later, Janet and Jack hear a loud thud and then they hear Shannon crying. (gasps) Oh, Shannon. They run out of their room and down the staircase, crumpled in the corner of the landing was Shannon. She's confused. She's crying. She hadn't gotten out of bed. She hadn't walked down the hallway. She doesn't remember doing any of this stuff. So how did she suddenly fall down the stairs? And this was the turning point for the Smurls, who again were quite religious, and they realized they needed to find someone to actually come over and help them stat. They can't do it on their own. Because clearly their children are not being thrown down the stairs in the middle of the night while they sleep. Or also taken over. Like, was she momentarily possessed? Yeah. And slept, walked around. Yeah. I don't know. Ugh. So Janet would try to do some investigating herself. We took a quick break to pee. uh, And... I was just looking up and I was like, gosh, if that thing falls while we're recording. I know. I've been watching you because when you move back and you kind of like I know, hit the carp a little bit, like, there's a giant heavy bowl above Sabrina. <laughs> and well, and also I have a giant crock above me that's holding these really heavy velvet curtains onto, onto the mantle. So, so because behind you- these beautiful curtains is my bathroom <laughs> and my child's play area. <laughs> It's not just set design. It is no. practical covers. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but uh, you all will be witness. Shall we be conked, conked on the head? <laughs> Knocked out. Yeah. We're not possessed. We're just unlucky. <laughs> or, or risky with our set we're design. We're being attacked by dark things. Back to the Smurls. So now Janet is really... There's a fire under her ass to get some help even more than there was before because now everyone is being physically attacked in their homes and aggressively. It's not like they're just getting poked or scratched. No. Like, this is Shannon was like potentially life-threatening. Yeah. Yes. So she goes to the library. She goes daily, actually, and she reads about paranormal activity. She reads about other people's accounts. She's trying to understand the paranormal and what they're doing to potentially trigger it what other people have done to try to get rid of it. Like she is trying to do everything she possibly can to figure out what the hell is going on in her house. Right. So enter one of their friends who happens to be a priest, Father Malone. He goes over for dinner one night and he blesses the house. But the demon did not want Father Malone there. Surprise, surprise. And so Father Malone really struggled to go room by room blessing the home because the pressure, the energy – it was just trying – he felt like he was basically being suffocated. Like each uh, room had like less oxygen in it. He was just really struggling. And so clearly this thing was trying to push Father Malone out of the house. Listen, I don't know if I have a caffeine headache or what, but there have been certain periods of this story as you talk about it that I get like such a sharp headache right here in this spe- yeah. specific spot. And immediately Ooh. when you're talking about Father Malone doing this, like – it was like almost, you know, like those headaches where it feels like pulsing because you're in the psyche of a demon. And so you're feeling the pain it feels when the priest is near. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I like that better than the feeling what Father Malone was feeling. Yeah. But Father Malone, he's he's determined to help them out. So he yeah. does actually get through the whole house and he does finish the blessing. And it seemed to work okay. because when he left, it was completely silent. The next day, completely silent. The next day completely silent the third day Uh hauntings of course day three mary smurl on the other side of the duplex was lifted in her bed what is this time with the mattress is lifted with her no the weight of her mattress is lifted with her listen she had to jump from the bed that was levitating this is an old woman we do have to give the demon credit for strength very strong demon but horrifying horrifying also clearly has like a thing for levitating people. Right. Which I get. That is very scary. <laughs> and also pretty cool. Like if I could levitate, yes. I would. But like, I don't know. Take me on a journey. Take me on a magic carpet <laughs> ride. I was just going to say. Like, let's go see the stars at night. Like, I would love to see you above the trees. You want to be wine trees. and dine. Do you want to be romance? Yeah. Te- if you want to lift me, you can. You want the scene from Twilight with But Bigfoot. yeah, we got to both benefit from this. <laughs> so then the Smurls, they are like, this is horrible. Not only are we experiencing everything, but now our in-laws slash parents who are older are also being physically attacked. It's moved across to the duplex yeah. and is now not just spooking John and Mary Smurl with just appearing every once in a while or odd noises. It is now attacking them physically as yeah. well. So the Smurls call another priest. They call Monsignor Bryant. 
And Monsignor Bryant came over and he did a blessing. And it seemed to work again. For three days? For a few days. Uh, day three. So then the Smurls call on a university researcher who suggests that they keep a diary of all of the activity and what happened around them at that time. Smart. So this did prove to be helpful because as the Smurls began to jot this down, they began to notice some patterns. So for example, if they were upset about something, the entity would draw a energy from them and inevitably they would experience a pretty intense haunting right after that. So they worked really hard to remain calm, but it didn't completely stop the activity. And also you're human. Yeah. And you're probably so incredibly scared and anxious. Yeah. Like you might be acting calm, but deep down inside of you, you're panicking. Right. And also there's other stuff going on in life outside of just living in your house that is haunted. Like, yes. These kids are going to school. Who knows if they're having problems with friends or like within themselves or sisters yeah, or right. you there's know so much yeah they have jobs they have friends they have a new neighborhood they, there's so much going on yeah so then janet's friend suggested that they reach out to someone who she had read about ed warren and his wife lorraine warren and janet made the most important phone call of her life ed and lorraine warren they're demonologists who've taken on thousands of cases. They would investigate some of the most haunted places and terrifying possessions. Which like, we've talked about. Yes. Some of them. Yeah. Amityville Horror House. Yeah, Conjuring, the Conjuring House. House. Yes. Yeah. So they were involved in a lot of the really, really big cases that a lot of us know because some of the things that they investigated have now turned to movies and books yes. and, and television shows that haunt our dreams. Also, but, we will acknowledge like we know that they can be a polarizing and topic yes. of discussion in the paranormal world. Everything they did is not perfect, but they had and have made such an impact on the paranormal world. Totally. And they did help people while maybe they also stirred some things up in some cases. Right. Like if you attended our Conjuring House tour or mm -hmm. if you watched it when we streamed the live, you'll know that Andrew Perrin and her family at the Conjuring House had a less than pleasurable experience with the Warrens. But other people did feel like they were really helped by them. Right. So Janet Smurl made the phone call to Ed and Lorraine. Lorraine was a gifted clairvoyant. Ed was the only non-ordained demonologist recognized by the Catholic Church. And they had investigated thousands of places. So their resume was huge. Stacked. They, yeah, stacked. Like These were yeah. good people to contact. And at this point, Janet had had two priests in the house. She'd contacted so many people. She'd done so much research on her own. So this kind of seemed like a good place to go. The Warrens came with experience, but also a very tough vetting process. The Smurls still made the call, hopeful that the Warrens would believe them and help them. The Warrens did hear them out and agreed to meet. So Ed and Lorraine, alongside their friend Diane, who was also a clairvoyant, they drove out to the Smurls place in Pittston, Pennsylvania, and they parked in front of the duplex. They were waiting to see if they could pick up on energy from outside. And parked outside, they felt nothing. So then they go in. And the Smurls seemed quite different from a lot of the families that the Warrens had encountered because the Warrens said usually when they're brought in, it involves a lot of, at that point at least, if it hadn't been something that had been occurring within a family previously, it was now that they had encountered all of this demonic energy that there was, you know, a broken family, a lot of abuse, a lot of sure. drugs and alcohol, depression, suicidal ideation. Usually there's a lot that comes with the families that they're helping or the people, the individuals. Right. But this family, the small family, they seemed so different. They seemed to still really be intact, just terrified. And mm. so they felt it was interesting to see kind of like that there was still some calmness, still some quote unquote from the book, like sanity, which isn't typical of many of the cases that they take on. So Ed is now asking them some background information. He's trying to vet them. Do they use any Ouija boards? Have they ever used any Ouija boards? Do they read about witchcraft? And as Ed is explaining kind of why he's asking these questions and how he's trying to create this profile for the Smurls and the potential hauntings, Lorraine and Diane, the two clairvoyants, they wander around the house to see if they could sense anything. And while ascending the stairs, Diane immediately picks up on an energy. Lorraine picks up on it as well. I just got so cold. Did you? I've been cold. My back is freezing I've, cold. I've I, been there's cold. There's a chill behind me. I got it when Ooh. you first brought up Lorraine and Ed and Diane walking into the house. I was sweating before And this. I 
just was like, you know what? I'm not going to say anything because I don't want it to be real. Yeah. But no. Oh, my God. I'm freezing. Yeah. And I'm literally covered by velvet mm-hmm. tarp. And we have 72 degrees big in. lights on us right now. Yeah. We, uh, we should be sweating. And I was sweating before this. Great. So glad it's we're interesting filming this in my house. Because <laughs> I do feel like when people, when Ed and Lorraine are brought up, like I almost feel like the paranormal world has a reaction to yeah. them. Yeah. I think so too. It's one of those, I mean, I know we talk about Greg and Dana Newkirk nonstop, but like the contrast is so extreme. I know. Especially even like with the reaction that spirits get, have. Everything I've been getting yeah. this episode is on my left side. Oh, really? Yeah. Like I'm I like getting just, it down my spine and like into my butt. Like it's like a, it's almost like a three inch stripe of cold. Like I'm getting a spinal tap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting an epidural again. <laughs> Oh my gosh, weird. And just on your left side. Yeah. But then the headache in the middle. No, well, the headache's right here. It's on my left oh. side too. Okay. Well, the great. This is a two parter. So we don't get to <laughs> stop. So Lorraine is picking up on this energy as well as they're going up the stairs. They said that it felt like walking through a door and feeling evil on the other side. Mm. They wandered the home and they picked up on three different spirits being there as well. So not evil spirits, but not great spirits. Well, because in the very beginning, Dawn saw multiple figures and shadows Floating in, in her room. Yep. And then there yeah. was also like, you know, there was the demonic entity we can presume that came in the black cape and a black mist. But then there was also the white, white mist, mist that materialized. Yeah. Yeah. So it did seem like maybe there were multiple spirits or multiple hauntings going on. And that is something that Diane and Lorraine were picking up on. So they found three different spirits. They said... These spirits weren't anything that some prayer and perseverance couldn't, you know, take care of. So there was an elderly woman who was very confused. There was another woman who was a little bit more violent and angry and aggressive. And then there was a man with a mustache who was also a little bit temperamental. Hmm. There were two angrier ghosts and then one older woman who just was confused. Was confused. Which also stirs up a lot of, like, energy, I'm sure. Yes. In the book, they had suspected that this woman, like, if she had been living – might have been suffering from dementia, like a bit confused about where she was, who she was, what was going on, who was around her. So maybe a spirit that was easily influenced and swayed by the other spirits. Mm. So upon entering the very last room in the house, the two women were drawn to the closet. Of course. They open it and it is just reeking of sulfur and this demonic energy just wafts out and washes over them. And so the women together, they quickly say a prayer, and then they return downstairs to tell the Smurls that they were indeed amongst a demon. And this demon was here to destroy the family. The dun, demon dun, uses dun. the other spirits to his advantage. So he basically employs the other three. And the demon takes on many forms. So it can I sound like laughing children. I doubt that children. they're being paid, though. They're being- They're for sure not. Forced into servitude. A hundred percent. So all of the the flapping wings, the sounds of children playing, the sounds of a couple fighting, that is the demon mimicking others and taking on various forms. So the Warrens are now officially accepting the case. This was the quickest vetting process they probably ever had. We're signed on. So the Warrens and the Smurls, they gather around the dining table and they're discussing their theories. Next steps, possible reasons for the hauntings, where to go from here. These are all things that they need to discuss that night because now it's official that they're going to investigate or the Warrens are going to investigate the Smurls haunting. So Ed believed that the demon had been there for a very long time and that it had been playing in wait for people to feed on, which makes sense because this was the haunted house on the street for long before the Smurls ever came. It always had this weird energy, this weird stain, odd things happening. So it makes sense that this was yeah, yeah. a good place for a demon. Plus, one of the units had been vacant for a long time. The other one always had fresh people cycling through fresh, as a rental. Fresh people. Yep. So Ed also said something that he also said at the Conjuring house. Can you guess what it is? That the women, puberty? Yep. Yeah. Four pubescent girls were a perfect snack. Yummy. Feasting on their emotions, their mood swings. It sounds very familiar to what the parent family had experienced at the Conjuring house. And so basically he was saying, like, there's nothing really you can do about that. Like, you have children and children have to and grow up. And PMSing yeah, daughters. There's, yeah, there's puberty and hormones and that's just the way it is. Yeah. But it is something that does attract demonic entities because there's just so little control over emotions. And it's easy to kind of have a child, a teen, like, violently swing into different sure. energies. 
I love that we have to like assign, we as humans want reason, right? We want Mm -hmm. to assign reason to something. And it might just be that these demons like this location or like there's an energy there. there. Before the girls were. Yeah, 100%. It was already there, but maybe it was exacerbated. Sure. By these four girls, you know. But it could have been any family that moved in and it would have been the same situation. Yeah. Ed also warned that one of the tricks that this demon had displayed or could display was tormenting one family member at a time. So kind of isolating, picking someone and trying to make them experience it alone and make them question like, am I sane? What am I experiencing? Am I being targeted? And just really make other individuals also question if that person actually did see anything at all. Which is why I feel like this case is different because it didn't do that, really. Well, it did a lot of isolated attacks, but it did plenty that involved multiple people. Yeah. Yeah. Which is even scarier because it it also means that it has so much strength that it doesn't need to do those other things to get enough energy and to continue in its haunting. So the next day, the older Smurls, Mary and John, they come over to join Ed and Lorraine explaining what they had also experienced and also to participate in the investigation. After an hour, it was time to draw the demon out. So this was the Warren's first step, basically, in actually trying to rid the house of the demon. Confront the demon. Yes. They set up an infrared 35 millimeter camera in Janet and Jack's bedroom. And together, the group said six prayers. They said three Our Fathers and three Hail Marys. The lights were turned off. Ed pressed play on the tape player he had, which triggered this really beautiful and angelic version of Ave Maria that filled the room. Ave Maria. It was us. It was this recording. Uh, Yes, they used our voices. (laughs) I feel like that was pretty good. It was not horrible. I mean, ask me again when I listen back. (laughs) But in our heads... I felt pretty fucking confident about also that. <laughs> breaking some of what well, that's actually happening. It sounded pretty decent. So they have all of this like angelic music and they're praying together. They're in this group. They're setting all of these intentions. And obviously this is supposed to be a trigger for the demon and have the demon crawl out. When the song ended, Ed flips the lights on and Lorraine had sensed a light coming from the closet of the bedroom, but nothing more. She wasn't sure that it was successful. Is this the same closet that the dark force and smell was coming from? I think so. Okay. I don't remember, but I think so because later on in the story, which we'll get into in part two, there was a specific closet that they believed was kind of a portal or like a pathway in between the two duplexes. Of course. Yes. And of course that was in Janet and Jack's bedroom. So they were like, the demon didn't come out. We have to try it again. So they turned the lights off. Ave Maria fills the room, and they pray. And this time, everyone's heads turn sharply towards the sound of something ripping off of the wall. A large mirror that had been mounted onto a dresser, like metal brackets and wood, was being violently thrown back and forth, shaking, shaking. The TV, which was unplugged, now turned on. The screen, a haunting white glow, while having no way to turn on on its own. Right. No electricity. Very poltergeist, yep. The dresser shaking more violently now. The drawers are opening and closing. The entire piece is rocking back and forth. And so Ed jumps into action. The demon is being drawn out. He has his holy water in hand and he walks through the room. He's throwing the water, throwing it. He's commanding the spirit, be gone in the name of Christ. He's repeating this phrase over and over, interspersing his commands with these prayers, with these Catholic prayers, over and over, again and again, drenching the room. And slowly, gradually, the activity begins to dissipate until nothing happened at all. The mirror stopped shaking, the dresser drawers untouched, the TV now turned off, and the Smurls felt like this was their miracle. Finally, they were rid of the entity that was tormenting them for months. Mm -mm. But as the Warrens gathered their things and headed through the threshold of the duplex's front door, Ed turned to them and told them, this is only the beginning. The demon was most certainly still inside. And I'm still shaking. (laughs) I'm freezing cold. I'm not as cold, so whatever it is is over there with you. Okay. What's up, buddy? (laughs) Well, you'll have to return next week when we record part two. (laughs) Okay. It is 
chaotic. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrifying. I could not, even if you felt a sense of calm after that experience, like I would not want to stay in that house. I would not want Ed and Lorraine, especially leaving on that note of it'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. I, like this is only the beginning. Yeah. Oh, and I, I feel so bad for this world because not only did they experience all this, but like they'd experienced this so many times before with the priests where it's like, oh my God, it's over. And then it comes back or like it's dormant for a few weeks and they're like, it's over. And then it comes back. And I understand that like finally <sighs> Ed and Lorraine Warren, they want it to be over so badly. And Ed and Lorraine Warren, the people who are the most famous people to investigate these things, agree to come to their house and they do the thing that they do to rid all the other houses of, of these demons. Mm -hmm. And then it seems to make the demon go away. And obviously, they're going to be hopeful. Obviously, they're going to think it's gone. And then to just be like, sorry, this is probably going to take months. I mean, I guess they've been through a lot. Yeah. I do feel like there's something very positive about the Smurls where they continue to have hope throughout all of this. That's true. Which because is again, nice. yeah, they're not an ordinary haunted family, yeah. or at least not the ones that the Warrens had come in contact with. All righty. Well, can't wait to hear what happens. It is so, like every single thing in next week's episode is like an attack. It's so crazy. Great. So buckle up. Maybe listen in your car. Wait, wait no. Maybe go on a walk I was somewhere far car. from home. Not in a car. Not near yeah. your house. Maybe listen at work. Who doesn't want a haunted workplace? That's yeah, kind of fun. Yeah, exactly. That would be fun. Yeah. And it's like not your problem. <laughs> 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 You'll probably quit that job in a couple of years anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a listener story. Okay. Um from our listener, Holly, who actually tried to send this to us so many times and wouldn't send. Ooh, a haunted email. Yes. It is called, I punched a demon girl to stop her from taking over my body. <laughs> oh, my God. We love I a love good this. punch the demon yeah. story. I think the Smurls could have taken a note from you. Hey there, ghostesses. My name is Holly. And buckle Hi, up Holly. because I've got a wild tale that I'm so ready to share. Growing up with a mom who was practically a ghost whisperer, I was always surrounded by the paranormal. From a ghost cat watching sunrises with me to an old lady crocheting in our living room. Recently, I dove into the world of goblins and mysteries thanks to Hellier. Thanks to hey, Greg, Greg and Dana. Dana. Kirk. But things got weird real fast. Picture me in the kitchen cooking up some dinner <laughs> oh. in your cauldron. When all of a sudden the bathroom light behind me started flickering crazy. And so I ask it to please stop. And immediately the door starts swinging wildly. And I'm like, mm, okay, can you chill? Because I'm hungry and I just want to eat. <laughs> so after a stern, please leave, things do calm down. Good. Or so I thought. Oh, okay. Also, it came in kind of violently from the get-go. It was aggressive. Like it was, yeah. Yeah. It was like, hello. There was no lead up. So the paranormal universe decided to mess with me. A swollen eyeball. It's not clear whose. I don't know what. Holly, we might need some specifics there. Like an animal or a human? I don't know. And then there was a crow trying to audition for a Hitchcock film at my window, which, by the way, the crow was okay. <laughs> so my mom gave me advice. Burn sage and maybe lay off the spooky shows for a little while. But can I fully stop? Absolutely not. <laughs> Did I take a break from my beloved Hillier? No. <laughs> so let's talk dreams. I've had sleep paralysis many times and I've astral projected like twice in my life. No biggie. But in this dream, it was next level. I was in my bed body asleep, but I was sitting up in bed and I spotted this normal looking girl with light brown hair in the hallway. So I speak to her and I tell her she can speak to me if she has good intentions. This girl did not say a single word and ran away. What did I do? I followed after her. What? No. <laughs> Why? I followed her out to the hallway and she turns into this dark drained figure and dashes towards my room <gasps> and tries to cozy up in my bed next to my body. Oh my God. What the fuck? Um, no. Nope. Ew, 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 ew. Oh God. And it also the fact that this thing got to your body before you did. I know. And you're like out there stretched it tethered to out. your body. Oh God. Not on my watch. Cue me running to my bed, throwing punches like a ghost fighting champ and hitting her in the cheek and twice in the arm. And it Hell worked. Hell yes. Hell yes. Still, in my astral form, I went to my body and started shaking it and shouting, you are Holly. You are Holly to her own body. I just got full body chills. How many times Truly. did this happen to you? Because I feel like you just created like the blueprint of what you should be doing. 100%. 
Holly eventually woke up with crazy goosebumps and absolutely freezing despite it being 80 degrees under the blanket. So there you have it. A demon girl got a surprise wake up call from yours truly. Is something really trying to get my attention from watching the show? Did I invite something in? Who knows? Thanks for listening to my story and thanks for making the coolest community and podcasts around. See you on the other side, ghostesses from Holly. Holly, that, that is so wild. And the fact that Holly also tried to send this so many times and it didn't come in. Yeah. How cool that Holly does get to astral project often. And punch demons. And punch demons. Yeah. Yeah. To like be so conscious in the astral projection that Holly's like, I know exactly how to move my body and go and throw punches and speak and say things. And yeah, I mean, that that probably saved Holly in that moment. To physically interact. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is always my biggest fear with astral projection. And I feel like it's something we've talked about. And the movie Insidious is all about is if you astral project, you're almost leaving your body as an empty vessel for something. And this little girl, demon, is like, hi, come out here. Come follow me. Follow me. And then I'm going to run and steal your body. Yeah, that is terrifying. I told you this before that I tried to do Brian Weiss's past life regression. Mm -hmm. And you have to go into like this hypnosis state. And my mom was so scared because both of us have astral projected before accidentally. And she was so scared that something was good, that I was going to like leave my body and something was going to come in because I'm also doing it in our like haunted right. house that she sat outside of my bedroom door the entire 40 minutes that I was doing it, just like trying to listen for anything stirring no. or because she also, my mom like will hear yeah, spirits. Things. So yeah. clear audience. Yeah. She was waiting. It did, I wasn't possessed, I don't think. So no, <laughs> no, fine. you seem pretty good. But it is, it is yeah. a fear because it's something that can happen. Well, I mean, it's like that one time I astral projected and heard the voice in my ear that yes. said, wake up. Yes. And fully something shot was, back I'm into sure my body. was coming for you. Yep. So if you've been possessed or if you have any ghostly tales, please email them to us at twogirlsoneghostpodcast at gmail.com or join us on Patreon because every Tuesday night we go live and invite you all to join us and share your ghost stories live with us on Campfire Stories. I don't remember what else we have. We have social media. Uh, go to Two Girls, One Ghost to check out the American Eagle gift card giveaway. And check us out on YouTube, especially for next episode, because well, I won't tell you why, but you might want to see it. And thank you to our editor, Jamie, for editing our podcast. And thank you to Gus for stepping in for Sven. Pleased to meet you. Be acquainted with you. Gus is cute. You're going to do a bat. little more work to... Help protect us because we both felt weird during this episode. Yes. Thank you. We love you all. And we will see you on the other side. side.